There we go. Well, welcome everybody. I didn't know there was going to be so many people. This is Brian's favorite joke, by the way. So many people interested in a study of tithing in the church. Go figure. No, this is a class on the end times. This is actually, it's got to be my favorite class. I love to study about God's plan for the end of the age. I've been doing teaching here. Well, well I'll introduce myself. I'm Jeff Verdorn, my wife, Julie, over here. I have three kids, Jacob, Sarah, Sam. Uh, they all went to Southwest Christian High School. Two are now married. I have three grandkids. I've been attending Grace Church for about, not quite 30 years, I think, maybe 27, 28 years. And I've been teaching at Grace Church for just over 25 years. I think this is my 25th year, actually, of teaching at Grace Church. Um, I taught biblical worldview and culture at Southwest Christian for a while, for about four years, uh, kind of as a side job for a while. So I've done that. And uh, I, you can catch me on My Faith Radio a couple times a week with on afternoons with Bill Arnold. KTIS is the FM side. The talk side is 98.5 HD2 or 900 AM or 96.35. I can't, 96.5. I can't remember the FM side, but... 98.58, or just go to myfaithradio.com and click on the app and you can listen there. So um, Tuesdays afternoon from five to six, every other Tuesday from five to six is my teaching time. Thursdays from four to six is something called Guy Talk. And it actually has become their biggest show over at Faith Radio. And we just have a lot of fun answering Bible questions. And there's three of us uh, with Bill Arnold, and we spend two hours just answering questions on air. So, and you can catch those podcasts anytime. And sometimes, uh, I in my uh, emails, how many of you didn't get the email after registering? I sent it out last Thursday. You didn't get the email. Well, some of you signed up after I sent the email out. Some of you actually signed up today. So I'm pretty confident you didn't get the email that I sent out on Thursday. All right. So I sent out an email. It's from the list that's uh, on the website. So you have to register, your email's gotta be in there and then you'll get the weekly emails, all right? So I will send out a weekly email summarizing what we did, what's coming up next week. And if I make any references or extra handouts or whatever, or uh, whatever, I will put it in that email and you'll have it once a week. Uh, you can always, and by the way, that comes from Grace Church, not from my personal email, cause it goes through the system. And sometimes those end up in spam folders. So before you uh, start hollering to the church about where's my email, check your spam filter, and then you can holler at the church. Um, what else? Admin. Other admins. Okay, the book. I printed off. If you've taken this class before uh, or twice, or if this is your third time, you should be teaching this class by now, by the way. If this is your third time, I want you teaching this class after this time. All right. The book is basically the same. Um, one of the things I had to do, unfortunately, is I needed to take the tabs out. I used to have tabs in the book for each of the lessons. I'm going to turn this down just a tad. Is that okay? Is that okay? Because I'm getting just a little. How's that? Is that too much? That's okay? All right. Um, what? Oh, yeah, whose phone is talking? Your watch is talking? So, hammers work, too. Just ask Hillary. No, we never get political in this class. Um, I used to put tabs in the sh in here, but they were, they got everything. You guys notice everything's gotten more expensive. Well, the book got a lot more expensive to print this time versus two years ago. I teach this class about every two years or so, and uh, between two years ago and and now, the the cost of the book just went way up. So I had to take the tabs out, so it'll be a little less convenient for you. But if you've got the old book, just use the old book. Um, if you uh, if open up the first page, by the way, and I'll just show you, give you a little introduction. There we go. 
So here's the agenda. Um, typically in this 12 lesson class, I usually spend 15 to 16 weeks um, on this topic. I had to shave it down a little bit. Julie and I just got back from Europe on Wednesday evening. So uh, it's it's about two in the morning for me right now. So, um, and uh, by the way, we were, I was talking to someone before the class. Julie has noticed that before every time before I start a new class, something seems to happen. You know, there's always this spiritual battles going on all the time and who knows how they manifest themselves and so on. Well, she's noticed that before I start a class, there's always something happens. So we get back from Europe. My tooth is hurting. I've been hurting for about three days. I get into the dentist the next morning and they say, well, I think you got a root canal. You got to go in and get a root canal. So I got scheduled the next morning, Friday, and I get in, I'm sitting there for over an hour and he's working this thing, working. How many of you have had a root canal? Yeah, it's great, isn't it? You've had it, Brian's, Brian, even Brian's had a root canal. And uh, he doesn't finish it up. How many of you had to have two sessions to get your root canal done? So it's not uncommon. You had to have two too? All right, so he finishes up. I get home. Well, I get this wicked fever Friday afternoon and I'm out for two days. Finally, Sunday morning, I'm feeling kind of broken, it's gone and so on. So this leading up to this class has just been uh, something, but... Anyway, so we have a couple less weeks this semester than I normally do. So that means a couple of the lessons that I normally spend maybe two weeks on, we're going to have to squeeze into one week. But that's kind of the story of this class. Because my first Revelation class that I took was actually a two-year class on Revelation uh, from a, a Precept Ministries. It's called Precept Upon Precept. Precept uh, does a great job in a number of ways, but one of them which we can't do here, but we'll talk about this a little bit more, is that they tell you, put the commentaries aside, study the Bible for itself, let the Bible interpret the Bible, let the Spirit be your teacher, right? One of the problems that we have anymore is that we've got this thing called the internet, and you can, you can research issues galore and see everybody's opinion, and they've got a slick website, and they look professional, and they say, oh, this sounds right. And unless you compare it to the word. So part of my struggle in this class is, is the end times is hard. All right. It's, I describe it as putting a puzzle together from scripture, except you don't have a picture of the cover of the box. Right. So you're taking all these pieces from scripture. And by the way, that's all over scripture and you got to piece them together. Right. And if they don't fit, you know, sometimes they go in there and you think it fits, but it really doesn't. But you kind of leave it there for a while and then finally, ah, that doesn't fit. And so you got to take it out. Well, if you don't know all the pieces, someone's going to tell you, well, this is what the puzzle looks like. But you haven't put all the pieces together yet. And so all you hear is, oh, that's what the puzzle looks like. Right. Well, someone could tell you the puzzle looks like anything. Unless you do your own due diligence and put the pieces together, you'll not, you're not going to know whether they're right or whether they're not. Every theory on the end times. How many of you know there's more than a couple of theories about the end times out there, right? Yeah, they're all, they're all, it's all over the place. And with the internet, it's gotten even more prolific. It's, it's all over the place. So we're going to talk about some of the principles tonight in our introductory lesson about how we approach scripture and and then trying to balance in this class wanting you to understand the plan but also understanding we don't have two years actually two years on revelation and then i did a year on daniel which is going to be our lesson second lesson next week that's going to be the hard one especially for you math challenged people that's going to be the hard one all right so when we get there um but it's just it's it's just hard but i I know a lot of people over the years as I've taken this class have said, man, it's been, it was like a fire hose. It didn't make sense. And then finally things started clicking after a while, right? Well, I've changed the way I start this class. We're going to do an overview of the end times tonight. I never used to do that. Okay. Why? Well, because I wanted you to struggle with the text 
I wanted you to stare at the pieces. I wanted you to put the pieces together. And we'll still do some of that. I've got a little bit of homework on each lesson because I want you to go in, put your nose into the word and study it, and look at it, become familiar with it, get some of this, these ideas and this language familiar in your head, and then we'll come and put it together. I don't want to teach as much as I want to, to guide. All right. I say this in all my classes. I don't want you to believe anything because I say something. I want you to know what you believe and why you believe it from scripture. Amen. All right. So, but I'm, we're going to do an overview. So we're going to have to start at the end where I like to leave the end. I used to leave the end and I just got so many comments that said, oh, I was so lost for so many weeks, but I, I hope this will change that because we're going to do an overview tonight of the end times. But here's the schedule. You guys can see all the schedule. Remember, we have in-person, we have Zoom. By the way, how many people? We got 36 people on Zoom right now. So everybody say hi to the Zoom folks. So we got people in Canada, in Florida, in Arizona. Where was the last one? Denver. So we got people all over the place watching tonight. So welcome all the Zoom folks. I will record this if Richard reminds me every week to record it. I will record this and then we'll put it up on YouTube. And so if you miss a class, and by the way, you need a doctor's note if you miss any class, all right? I, I love to have, to see your face and to interact and to hear your questions and so on. And you just don't get that when you're on Zoom, you're busy drinking your coffee, you're checking your Instagram and you're doing other things. I, I know it, I can see you. I see you right now. I see you. Somebody was scrolling through their Instagram. Well, yeah, I see it. But you know what I mean. It's just more engaging in person. So if you can show up in person, but Zoom is fine too. And then if you miss it, I will post it usually within a couple of days. And in my email that I will get out after each class, it will have the link directly to that YouTube. And th that link will grow every week throughout this semester. So by the end, you'll have an email with all the links to all the classes in, uh, in YouTube that you can go back to at any time. All right. The book, by the way. Oh, so next page. This is the lesson descriptions. So as we go through tonight, it's going to be kind of an overview, understanding the end times. Why do we want to study the end times anyway? Why do we do it? I remember when I was taking the Revelation class, I would come home and I would get so excited. I said, Julie, God's telling us what's going to happen. This is so cool. This, got to, this needs to be on 2020 or Dateline or 60 Minutes or whatever. And it still hasn't been on Dateline or 2020 or 60 Minutes. So. So I teach it, right? But God has told us the future. And I just think that's so cool. And, and, and I think you should think it's cool too. But remember, as much as we like to understand what's going to happen, knowing the future, God's prophetic word and what he says is going to happen, studying the end times is much more about knowing the planner as much as it is knowing the plan. Amen? All right. So here are the descriptions, and then I got some handouts. The handouts, by the way, several of the handouts we will refer to directly. Some of the handouts I don't know that I'll actually end up getting to, especially in this little shortened version because we're missing a couple few weeks in this class. Um, but they're there for your reference, um, but just know they're there. So if, if you go to lesson one, this is my new tab page without a tab. And I put some notes there so you can open it up to the lesson. If you want to take notes, there you can. So the handout for tonight is actually kind of a handout on the theme that I was just talking about. It's my list of Jesus in every book of the Bible. Do you know that you can find Jesus in every book of the Bible? And I love to read this list, but I'm not going to. It just, it takes several minutes to get through it. But I encourage you when you get home, read it. Now, in order to do this, don't just read it. Read it out loud. Because otherwise you'll just kind of skim over it. But read it. Genesis, he is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. And go through. 
And when you, by the time you get to Revelation, and you'll see that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, you can't help but say amen. All right? So that's that handout. So it's in there. It's for your references, but I'm not going to uh, refer to it again. And then, of course, past that, it's lesson two. Every lesson, if you look at lesson two, has a little introduction page, just kind of my comments on the lesson. And then there will be three or four homework pages. Yes, we do have homework because of what I was just talking about earlier. I really want you guys before class to get familiar with the text that we are going to be dealing with. Now, some of you are not going to like the fact that I don't go through the lesson question by question by question. That's not what I'm going to do, right? I will most likely cover everything in the lesson, but it may be different than by just telling you what each question was. The questions are there for you to gain some familiarity with the text and the ideas and the concepts, okay? All right. Handouts free with commitment. This book came to you free. I just have one stipulation. This class will bless you. I know it will because I've seen many, many people blessed over the years from understanding God's plan for the end of the age. It will bless you, all right? But you have to commit to do the class. So it's free, but I just ask you to make a little extra commitment to say, okay, I'm gonna do this class and I'm gonna finish it and I'm gonna get through it, amen? All right. Oh, by the way, for all you Zoom folks, the, the books... You can pick them up at Grace Church at the reception desk, which is by door four. And to the right of the reception desk, they have some bins. And I we get our own bin now. We got a bin. We're somebody now. So in that bin, I will put a bunch of books. All right. So the books will be in there. Come and take a book. If you've already taken the class, try to use your old book. All right. Because, uh, yeah. But uh if you need to pick something up for, and by the way, if you're a Zoom person, several of you have emailed me, you've given me your addresses. I just picked up these, oh, that was something else that happened for this class. These were supposed to be ready end of last week. Then they said, well, we'll have them done on Monday. And I said, well, can I pick them up at noon? And I said, okay, Monday's fine, but I got my class Monday night, you know? They said, okay, we'll see you at noon. Well, I called them at 11.45 and said, I'll come and be there in 15 minutes. Well, we're not done yet. Well, you can come and pick them up at 5. And I said, I plan to be at the church at 5 to set up for my class. So they got them done at 4. So it's like, oh, got a little hot and sweaty setting up. and I'm just... But we're going. Um, I will mail those out to everybody if you... Um, haven't emailed me yet your address. Just email me, jeff at verdorn.com. And uh, will you put in a chat, jeff at verdorn.com? Um, also, Zoom folks, you can type a chat anytime. I won't read them, but Julie will read them. And if it's a question or whatever that you're asking, she'll interject for you into the classroom. All right. And weekly emails. I think that's all the admin. You guys excited? All right. I like to start every class with my goals. What are my goals for this study? I'm an ex-consultant, so you can't do anything without setting an agenda, putting out goals, and then evaluating it afterwards. It's just what we do, right? Here's my goals. To know him more, to trust him more, to put our faith in him more, through an understanding of God's plan for the end of the age. See what I'm saying? So in other words, any Bible study you're going to do, this goal is going to be your first goal and should be your first goal. I want to come to know God in a deeper, more meaningful way so I can know him, trust him more. Because the more we know somebody, the more we can trust somebody and as long as they prove trustworthy which god always does if you're going to trust somebody with your money they don't prove trustworthy you're not going to trust them with your money a babysitter if they don't tr prove trustworthy you're not going to trust them with your kids but god is always trustworthy and the more we learn that the more we understand that then the more we trust 
him. And isn't that what God says is how we're supposed to live? The righteous shall live by faith. There you go. And to understand, of course, God's plan for the end of the age. You know, there's something like $12 billion spent on trying to understand the future in this country through fortune cards and, you know, I'm a cancer, so I'm going to pull out a cancer thing and get my horoscope or fortune tellers or whatever. Billions spent on this. God's told us it's free. It's free. And he's told us what's going to happen. And by the way, it's a pretty cool plan. And I've read the back of the book. You know who wins? Yeah, we do. But we want to know the planner. Uh, here, that's a, I, that's not one of your handouts. This was just a document of Jesus in every book in the Bible. I think that's so cool. How many of you know George Mueller? George Mueller ran some orphanages in Bristol, England in the 1800s. And he, well, he was amazing in a lot of ways. You know, he never asked anybody for money. He just said, here's my need, here's my vision. And I'm going to let God do the rest. And he always, God always provided for him. In fact, there's one story, I think it's in his autobiography, where they didn't have any food one morning. And they got around the table and they said, we're out of food. And we don't know what we're going to serve the kids. And they started praying. And somebody knocked on the door. And they opened the door. And the guy said, hey, my wagon broke down here. I'm going to have to take the horses back. But I'm going to have to leave this wagon here. It's full of milk and cheese and eggs and stuff. Do you guys, can you use this? God provided. Isn't that cool? Well, at one point in his life, he, he wrote this in his autobiography. God then began to show me that the word of God alone is our standard of judgment in spiritual things, that it can be explained only by the Holy Spirit. Like many believers, I practically preferred for the first four years of my divine life, the works of uninspired men to the oracles of the living God. Isn't that a great line? He practically preferred the works of uninspired men to the oracles of God. The consequence was that I remain a babe both in knowledge and in grace. Hmm. You see what he's saying? He's saying, look, you can get the answers on all these theological questions by searching, you know, the internet or commentaries or books or so on. But until you commit yourself to the study of God's words, he says, I remained a babe. And I get it. I know a lot of this. How many of you have wanted to know a theological answer? And boom, the first place you go is some answer book. Now, a good teaching is a good teaching, right? And if it's based on the word of God, it's going to be valuable. But it should always point you back to God's word. And that's what I hope we do in this class. I actually have a great, 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 great grandfather. His name was Adrianus Kuyper. And there was somebody in his family that wrote a little uh, thing on his life. And it said this, but about that say, <laughs> no. but above all, he studied the Bible. The Bible was his passion, and his ultimate goal was to glorify God. Mr. Kuyper's first first read all of the commentaries on the Bible. He collected all of these he could, and then finally he pushed them all aside, every one of them. And he studied the Bible by itself. He goes on to say later that, and so he became a premillennialist. And he also said that he knew that one day the Jews would be gathered back to their land because it, he says, because it was promised so often in scripture, often without qualification. He didn't know when it was going to happen, but because God had said it was going to happen, he knew it would happen. And it says, remember, this was written at the turn of the last century. Actually, two centuries ago now, right? In the late 1800s. That's before Israel came back to Israel, right? I, I, we're going to get to meet this guy and compare notes on eschatology someday. That's so cool. So what is your view of the future? He left his harp in San Francisco. You know, over the years, 
as I've talked to people about why do you want to study the end times, what are your expectations, which is coming next, so start thinking of your expectations or questions you have for this class, I have found it very interesting that a lot of Christians don't have a concrete understanding of what their future is. They don't really have an understanding of, well, what does eternity look like? When Jesus says, thy kingdom come, well, what does that look like? And too many, I would say, have this understanding, well, I don't know if I can really get excited about floating on a cloud for all of eternity, you know, playing a harp. Well, that's not your eternity. And yet we see it and hear it all the time, right? This is actually my favorite. <laughs> actually, we were hoping for someone with drums. This is the class description. Jesus said the end will come after those days. Paul wrote that the end will come. Daniel added the end will come like a flood. What is the end? What happens during the end? What happens to believers? What happens to unbelievers? To Israel? Join us for this 12-week overview study where we will search the scriptures for answers to these questions and more, studying the events that God said must shortly take place. But even more, we will study the nature and character of the Lord through the revelation of Jesus Christ and the rest of Scripture, which is filled with references to the end times. Sound like a good description? All right, so class, what are your expectations for this class? What do you want to get? Now, I know we put 100 people in a room and people get quiet really quick, but this is a classroom, so raise your hand anytime. The rules of this classroom are there is no such thing as a... Dumb question, that's right. There's no dumb questions. So raise your hand, and if you have a question, chances are somebody else has the same question, so we'll bring it to light. Um, by the way, uh, I, I will ask you to do an evaluation, by the way, at the end. I said I was a consultant, right? We always evaluate everything after the fact. And I get a lot of evaluations that say, oh, great class, loved the class, uh, and loved all the rabbit trails. And then the other half of the class, the evaluations will say, great class, love the class, uh, but you got to limit the rabbit trails, right? Trust me that I know that when we're going too far on a rabbit trail, I'll cut it up. Sometimes they end up proving very valuable and spirit led, I would argue. So we'll just let it, but all right, I'll discern that. So don't worry about it. Could they be called spirit trails? Yes, they could be called spirit trails. I like that. Could they be called tributaries? Tributaries? <laughs> because of, yeah, I see. they could be called, well, you could call them a lot of things, I suppose. So, All right, expectations. What do you guys want to know or learn or study in the end time? By the way, we just went through, how many of you all finished up Troy's series on Revelation? Uh, two thumbs up, by the way, right? I mean, it it's, it shouldn't be taken for granted that, and I'm going to show one of Troy's uh, charts tonight, that our senior pastor from the pulpit just did a detailed study of Revelation that matches everything that we're going to learn here tonight, well, almost everything, a few little differences here and there. But uh, his big picture of the end times is exactly where, where the basis for our understanding is going to be, all right? So that's that's huge for, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years. And so to have that study done at Grace Church and to have him present an overview, uh, traditional dispensational overview of the end times is just huge. It was awesome. So, yeah. I think it's going to help me be more intentional about the seriousness of the times that we live in and the joy of being able to know what's coming. Yeah, describe the joy from knowing what's coming. What is that? What does that mean to you? In other words, if you know what's coming, what does that do for your view today, right now? Well, it, is, it will help me with people uh, because no matter what they say or come back with, I can have the joy in knowing that my answer is my answer. If they accept it, fine. If they don't, it's okay. Yeah. You know, Paul talks about our light and momentary troubles are nothing compared compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. I can't, I'm paraphrasing now. But he says, 
whatever you're going through today, right? God calls them. And, and these, I know people have gone through some very tough time. There, there's a woman at our church, Deanne, her daughter just went through brain cancer surgery. And she's even a couple weeks later, she's still struggling to identify simple objects. It's, the prognosis is good. Do, do you say to a family like that, that your troubles are light and momentary? I mean, these are life altering things, deaths in the family, children dying. I mean, you know, the world, the, the world's not a great place for a lot of people. Um, but compared to eternity, how do we see these troubles? It changes our perspective a little bit, doesn't it? That's why I love studying the end times. It changes our perspective. What else? Yeah, so when we know what's going to happen in the future, it gives us hope. That is uh, a big theme of our study of the end times, because it is our study of our hope. <laughs> Titus says, that the Lord's appearing, uh, this is the rapture, by the way, is our blessed hope, right? So yeah, I mean, it, people can survive many things if they have hope. When you lose hope, that's when desperation sets in. So this is a study of our hope. Our inheritance is our hope. Yeah. I'd like to understand imagery better and know when to interpret the Bible literally versus figuratively. Oh, great question. Let me get to a slide on that. So the question is, uh, I want a symbolism in the Bible and when to take something literally and when to take it figuratively, right? Um, really quick, it's relatively easy. Back up. This is a slide, so I don't want to get into this too much. We got to decide, are we going to algorize everything or are we going to take things literally? And... Um, Taking things literally on how we approach Revelation, how we approach the Bible for that matter, uh, and literally is actually not a great term. Um, a better term is what theologians call a grammatical historical. And that's basically saying, I want to understand what the writer intended when he wrote the text, right? What's the context? What was the intention? And did he intend for the listener to hear this as uh, a figure of speech or symbolism, or did he meant to it to be real? And I can tell you, it's actually very easy to tell the difference. Now, some are going to want to take and spiritualize all of Revelation, and we, we're not going to do that. These are actual events that are going to come upon the world, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but when Jesus says, uh, you know, I'm the gate, is that literal or figurative? Mm -hmm. Right. It's clearly figurative. Um, when he when he says, uh, and then I saw locusts coming upon the abyss, is that literal or figurative? Oh, not as easy as a question, is it? Is that I saw locusts coming out of the abyss. Is there such a place as the abyss? Well, what are these locusts? I have no idea. But it sounds like they come up out of the abyss. Now they have a face like a man and hair like a woman and, you know, so on. Well, is that symbolic language? Yeah. Hair-like, face-like. Now he's using symbolism or simile in order to describe these things. But the actual event of these locusts coming up out of the abyss is going to be a real event. So what else? Yes, ma'am. Look at scripture. What seems to be what scripture towards the second coming, what starts the second coming, what starts the rapture? Oh, great question. So Comparing scriptures between the rapture and the second coming. Um, by the end of this class, any passage that describes Christ's coming, you'll be able to identify and say that's the rapture or that's the second coming. Okay, easy. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? Because once you get the big picture, right, which we're going to try to build right away. By the way, the big picture is kind of like the puzzle. What's the first thing in a puzzle you do? The edges, you do the borders first, right? So we're going to set the borders and we're going to try to get the borders in place really quick. One of the things when you do a study of Revelation, one of the things that you don't do in a detailed study of Revelation is 
For example, next week, we're going to do Daniel chapter 9. Why is the tribute? Why do we believe the tribulation is yet future and a seven-year period? Well, you don't get that from Revelation, do you? You got to go to Daniel 9 to set the whole framework in order to understand there's a future seven-year period that's coming upon the world, all right? And then once you have a, a more understanding of the sequence of the events and, you know, all the key players and all the key events and so on, all those passages will fit right in. Plus, we'll do a detailed analysis when we get to the rapture of rapture passages and what's that all about and the second coming. And primarily to understand these are two different events as described in scripture. That's a very important concept because the post-trib folks want to put these events together and clearly in scripture they're described very differently okay at the rapture which way are people going up uh, at the second coming which way are people going uh, there's the start to the differences right so what else Yeah, so what our role is, you know, we were sitting around a campfire one night with some of Julie's high school friends, and we were talking about faith and and God and stuff, and I was getting a lot of pushback and stuff, and, and then someone brings up the guy in the Amazon. Well, what about the guy in the Amazon who's never heard of Jesus? Why are there so many people concerned about this guy in the Amazon? <laughs> If you're that concerned, why don't you fly down there and tell them about Jesus, for goodness sake. But it was like this, this argument. But then it, I don't know, it transitioned into the end times. And all of a sudden, nobody was debating anything because nobody had any basis for debating what we started talking about, right? Because this is kind of prophetic from the word of God and, and a lot of it they had never heard before. In... Lesson three, there's a journal page in the book, and it's a journal of how you've been blessed. This, I'm getting ahead of myself again here, but Revelation starts with a promise that blessed is he who reads the words in this book and heeds the words that are written in it. You will be blessed. One of my blessings, because I took this, I took this journal and, and wrote this journal over my two years of Revelation study. Do you know what one of my top blessings was was a sense of urgency for the time in which we live that was 20 27 28 years ago 30 years ago right so our role i would argue what's our role proclaim you know we are to fight the good fight of faith we are to be truth bearers we are to be light to the to the world the fact that Jesus is coming back should either be your blessed hope or your greatest fear, depending on where your heart's at. Amen? What else? The fewer expectations you have, the easier it will be for me to meet them all. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, we all for you. Oh, thank you. I would you you feel free to pray for me uh, at any time. I appreciate that very much. Yes. So it is. It's interesting. Whenever I start a class, there's always it's like ugh. All right, but it started now. All right, so we're covered. But thank you. I appreciate it. You know, and and to be honest, one of my greatest prayers for me personally. Do you know that passage where it says that workman, the one who correctly handles the word of truth, that's my greatest prayer, that we just handle this word correctly and properly. Amen? All right. Well, let's start with a little teaching. That's kind of the admin stuff, your expectations. I want to do a little thing on overcomers, and then we'll get to the overview of the end times. Let me pray. Lord, we do. We want to be that workman, one approved who handles your word properly, correctly. Um, 
We know that you are our teacher. You have given us your word. You have revealed yourself to us. You've revealed your plan to us. We know it's not easy, but we are going to dedicate ourselves to the study of your word, to examine the scriptures as, as you commended the Bereans to search the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So in this class, Lord, we just commit to examining the scriptures to see what of all the ideas and topics that we're going to discuss in this class are true from your word. Know what we believe and why we believe it from scripture. And Lord, we know you are a great teacher. You say you give us the Holy Spirit. He will lead us into truth. And Lord, as we look at the world, it's a messed up place. But you also say in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. I don't know why, as believers in Christ, we are so amazed when the lost world acts lost. Uh, but it does. And our great hope, Lord, is not in this world. It's not in governments. It's not in anything but in you. And I know how this story ends. What's that song? I know, I know. This is how this story ends. What? I can't remember the words. No. All right. Fighting the battle, you've already won. You've already won. Lord, you have already won the battle. And in fact, we're going to see that in just a few moments. So Lord, bless this time. Bless all the students during this semester in this class. Let it grow all of our faith and knowledge of you so that we can trust you more, Lord. We pray this in your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. To him who overcomes. In the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, there are seven letters to seven churches. Each of the seven letters has a description of Jesus. It has, here's what you're doing good. Here's what you're not doing so good. And here's a promise for him who overcomes. All right? That's the, generally the pattern of each of those letters. To Ephesus, he says this. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Hmm. Do you guys know at the back of the book, when we read about the new heaven and new earth, do you know what shows up in the new Jerusalem? The tree of life. When's the last time we saw that? Back in the garden. Now we're going to see it again at the end, and it's back. If you are an overcomer, you will get to partake in the tree of life. Oh, that sounds kind of cool. To Smyrna, Jesus says this. He, ooh, oh, I'm so sorry. That hurt me more than it hurt you, I think. Yes. To him, uh, no, Smyrna. He who, goodness, he who <laughs> overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Do you guys know what the second death is? What's the second death? Yeah, specifically, the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, right? So being thrown into the lake of fire is called the second death in Revelation. We'll get there. But if you're an overcomer, Scripture says that you will not be hurt by the second death. That sounds like a pretty powerful promise, doesn't it? Hmm. All right, let's keep going. To Pergamum. Jesus says, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Where did the manna come from? Came from heaven. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Well, this is kind of obscure. Now, a little history of Pergamum. You know, we put stones for people today. Who usually gets a stone in the ground? A dead person. Well, that doesn't sound so great. Well, in Pergamum's day, history records that if you were healed of something, you got a stone and they would put a stone out in a yard and put your name on it. So it means you've been healed. Well, you've been healed and you get a stone and you get a new name. Well, I guess that sounds pretty good. Let's move on. That one's not quite as clear. Thi Thyatira, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter he will dash them to pieces like pottery. Wow. Just as I have received authority from my father, I also give him authority and give him the morning star. Well, I know Jesus is going to rule, but this sounds like 
to him who overcomes is going to rule as well, given authority over the nations. That sounds pretty powerful, doesn't it? Sardis. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. You guys, you've heard of the book of life. Who's in the book of life? Believers. Those who will live forever with God are in the book of life. If you're an overcomer, God says, not only won't you be blotted out, it means you are in the book of life. <laughs> Pretty powerful promise? I think so too. Philadelphia, him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven. And I will write also on him my new name. God's going to write his name on you. Do you guys, you guys remember Toy Story? I always use this example. Remember the kid gets a new present, it's Buzz, 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 Buzz Lightyear, right? What's the first thing he does? He writes his name. You remember his name? Oh, good. I usually ask this question and everybody looks at me like a blank. Like, come on, Andy, remember he writes Andy. Well, we are God's possessions. We've been bought by a, by a price. That price was the blood of Christ, Peter says. We are now his, and he writes on us his name if you're an overcomer of course sounds pretty important to understand who is an overcomer oh that was philadelphia laodicea listen to this to him who overcomes i will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as i overcame remember this is jesus talking and sat down with my father on his throne how many of you have ever seen the oval office nobody one two in person, few of it, four or five. Um, do you think anybody could just walk in and sit behind that resolute desk in the Oval Office at any time? No, of course not, right? You'd be arrested. But God's saying to him who overcomes, I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne. Whoa, pretty big promise. At the end of the book of Revelation, in chapter 21, it says, he who overcomes will inherit all this. What's all this? It's all the description of the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that God just described, the streets of gold, the pearly gates, the tree of life, the river of life flowing down from the throne. And it says, if you overcome, you will inherit all of this. Don't you think it's pretty important to understand who is an overcomer? I agree. Let's figure it out. Who is an overcomer? Just happens to be my next slide. Some say that an overcomer is someone who overcomes something. And they might do a teaching on what needs to be overcome in order to receive the promise to the overcomers. But do you receive an inheritance because you earned it or because you were declared an heir? If you're declared an heir, you're going to receive the inheritance, right? Well, who wrote the book of Revelation? John, very good. The questions don't get much harder than that all semester, so don't... <laughs> Is this word for overcomer used anywhere else in scripture? Oftentimes, if you want to understand the meaning of a passage, you kind of look, where, well, where else is this used? So let's look to find out where this term overcomer is used in the Bible. Well, we look and we find it in two other books of the Bible, in 1 John and John. Who wrote 1 John? Easy. 1 John 5.5. 5. Who is it that overcomes? Here's your definition. You want to know what an overcomer is? John is going to tell us what an overcomer is, who an overcomer is. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Then you are an overcomer. 
in Christ, you are an overcomer. Why? Because who wrote the book of John? I told you they just get harder and harder. John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble, but take courage. I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus has overcome the world. He's overcome death. And because he's done that, and he's now in you, you now are an overcomer in him. What have you overcome? You've overcome the world. You've overcome death. You are an overcomer. So every single one of those promises are yours in Christ. Cool, huh? That, studying the book of Revelation, is why it's so fun. We will overcome. The Greek word, by the way, is nikeo. And it means to conquer, to overcome, prevail, to get the victory. I've read the back of the book. We win. So Revelation 27, 21, verse 7 says, He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. There's one artist's depiction of the new Jerusalem coming down. You see the pearly gates here, the streets of gold. It actually is a cube. It's described as a cube. You guys know how big that is? Quite large. <laughs> Good. We'll take that for now. Well, that's our inheritance. And everybody who's an overcomer will inherit that. So why study the end times? Okay, this is kind of the list of items where it's like, um, because oftentimes in the, what are your expectations for this class? I'll get something like, well, I'd like to just understand why we study the end times. If if we're going to be raptured out at the beginning of all this, right? Well, then why do I even study the end times? Why why bother? Why? What's the answer to that question? Okay, the questions just got a little harder. All right, I get it. Yeah. Oh, great way to describe it. Okay. Did you, did you hear what he said? We can see things forming that are going to need to be after we're gone, right? So the way I describe it is we see the stage being set for the end times to occur. Yeah. So now here's the here's a key distinction. And I think a lot of prophecy teachers um, step over this line a little bit in this sense. Are there any prophecies or things that precede the rapture of the church? And I say no, and you guys are all going to understand this by the end of this class, but I think the rapture is a signless event. There's no prophecies telling us when the rapture is going to happen. There'll be no date setting in this class, all right? None, zero. We can't know, all right? And I think that's clear, and we'll study that in all the all the details. But can we see certain things being prepared for what needs to be prepared in order for the for for when the end times comes and the answer is yes one example is that when john wrote the book of revelation and talked about a 200 million man army coming from the east you know there weren't even 200 million people on the planet at the time and china announced back in the late 70s or early 80s that they could amass an army of 200 million men. Oh, that might be a coincidence there, huh? How about things like the mark of the beast? We'll talk about this a little bit, but uh, it says that no one will be able to buy or sell unless they have a mark. Man, I can't imagine any kind of system where some authority says that you have to have something in order to participate in the economy in some way. Can't even fathom that, right? Oh, until COVID came along, and and the, and 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 we have the Chinese credit scoring system, where you can actually be not allowed to buy or sell if your credit score goes too low. And all of a sudden, when you start seeing things like this, right? So yes, we see the stage being set. All right. So that's a that's a a great reason. Number one came up earlier. Why do we study the end times? Because it's our hope. This is our hope. If you are low, if your hope bucket is low in this world, um, like it can get, 
uh, this is the class for you. All right. Um, light and momentary. Light and momentary. Light and momentary, right? All right. Two, to discern the times that we live in. Um, there's lots of descriptions about this. Let me read First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. What event is that? Rapture or second coming? Rapture. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Yes, that's the rapture. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. I'm sorry, I got one commentary here. Sisters is not in the Greek. When I read, does anybody mind, honestly, does anybody mind me just saying brothers? That's what the Greek says. Does anybody of any gender? I don't want to go here, do I? There's two of those, by the way. I like the masculine the Greek and the feminine. <laughs> There's two gen. Does anybody have any gender? When I say mankind or brothers, uh, okay, you get the point. I think a translation, by the way, it should be as accurate to the original language as possible. That's all I want. So just give me that. All right. Aren't there words in that language, Hebrew, and I think in Greek, that actually refer to neither? Yeah, how used. There, there actually is. That's what they're trying to do here. So the, the, you know that this didn't mean men only in the Greek. That's clear. And so they throw in in the English, instead of leaving it just as brothers, they'll throw in and sister, right? Even though it's not in the Greek. And they do that for readability or I would argue maybe inclusion in some way. But I, I've asked this question over the years. I've never found one person who feels excluded when it says mankind or you know, brothers, I say, oh, yes. So probably yep. It doesn't say their sex. It's what they are. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some translations that have, instead of saying uh, like mankind, and I'm trying to think of the Greek word and I can't, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember it. Um, they'll say people. In other words, they'll make it more generic. And it's like, well, okay, that's not wrong. That's that's I don't have a problem with that as much as adding English words. Okay, too much. That's a there's one of those rabbit trail things that we okay. human human humankind. There you go. Um surprisingly like a thief. You are all children of the light, children of the day. We do not belong to the darkness, to the night or to the darkness. So what's the what's the what's he saying? What's God saying here is that we are children of the light. We should we should know when the day of the Lord is coming, not because we know the hour of the day, but because he's told us that it's coming. Right. That's why we're children of the light. We know it's coming. Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming back to take you to be where I am also. Oh, OK. When? <laughs> someone's been through the class before what's the answer soon soon yes you guys know that for the new people here um by the way how many how many people here have never taken a class of mine before so a number of new people so nice to meet you um and by the way feel free after class come up meet my email's in the book by the way did i mention emailing me at the start of this? Yes. Yeah, email me anytime with questions. It might take me a few days to get back, but I will get back to everybody eventually. So, um, what was I saying? Soon. Oh, soon. I'm coming. I'm at the back of the book. I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me, Jesus says. Well, people look at that English translation of the Greek word. You remember what the Greek word is? 
Oh, you'd really impress me if you remember the no. Teku, T A C H U, Teku. Teku can mean soon, as in a short period of time, but it's been how long? 2,000 years. Is that soon? No, it's not soon. Well, yeah, day is like a thousand years. We'll talk about that. But no, it hasn't been soon. It's been 2,000 years. So a lot of people say, well, well, I don't get it. Why it's not soon. But you know what an alternative definition of the word teku is? Suddenly. I come as a thief in the night. Suddenly. I'm coming suddenly and my reward is with me. Doesn't that make all the sense in the world? Jesus says, I'm coming suddenly. Now, we aren't going to be surprised because we know it's coming. What about the world? Oh, the world's going to be surprised. Absolutely. Okay, so we know the time is coming. Why did my clicker stop working? There's no signs for the rapture. There'll be no date setting. I just said that. This day will not surprise us. Not because we know when it's coming, but because we know that it is coming. We see the stage being set, don't we? And so we need to, to, how are we prepared? Okay, this is, okay, the question just got a little harder. But think about this. How are we prepared for Jesus' return? Okay, so doing Doing what our master asks us. Is that how we prepare ourselves for the end time? If you want to get raptured, how can you guarantee that you're going to be raptured? Who said believe? Believe. 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 Should we be doing what God calls us? Should we be doing what God is calling Ephesians 4.1 to, to live up to the calling that we have received? Should we be living up to the calling we received? Yes. But how are we ready for the end times? By faith. Absolutely. Once you are in Christ Jesus, you are an overcomer. You are ready. You are prepared. There's nothing you need to do. The foolish virgins uh, and the, uh, the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. Oh, we ran out of oil. The oil is the Holy Spirit. They had to run and get some more. Oh, well, you better watch out, Christian. You might be one of the foolish virgins that has to go get oil if you're not careful no that's not what that means we'll cover that how are you ready for the rapture believe in the lord jesus christ All right be prepared the crown of righteousness you know there's five coin uh crowns talked about in scripture how many how many crowns can you wear at one time yeah, a lot of people describe these as five different crowns. I actually think God is describing one crown. He just describes it differently in Scripture. All right, we'll talk about that. When do we get our crowns, by the way? What's the event called? Anybody know? Yeah, the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat. That's when we will be rewarded. That's when we receive our rewards. I think the crowns are connected to that. You are going to receive a crown at the Bema, and it's going to happen that's the crown of righteousness. Anyway, I won't read that passage because we're, I got to go. Uh, and blessing and to know him. And we already, already talked about the blessing. Okay, quick word on prophecy. Prophecy to me is one of the most amazing things about scripture. As one commentary said, it's like God's fingerprints on the Bible. No other book in the entire world has fulfilled, provably fulfilled prophecy. God says something's going to happen, and then it comes true exactly as God said it's going to happen. Written hundreds of years before. How many of you, by chance, I don't remember who took it. How many of you have ever taken my Christ and prophecy class where we go through all the first coming prophecies for Christ? Anybody taken that? Nobody's taken that? Maybe that's the next class I got to do next semester. So... It's about 90 individual unique prophecies for the first coming of Christ, all fulfilled perfectly, all written at least 400 years, sometimes 1,500 years before Christ came. Who can do that? Only God, right? So no other book. I mean, there's uh, Notre Dame and some of these obscure prophecies. They're all just obscure, vague. You can have just about anything uh, be a fulfillment of a lot of them if you've ever looked at them. They're, they don't even make sense. 
Cyrus will set you back and set you back to Israel. 150 years later, Cyrus sends, sends Israel back to their promised land. Coincidence? I think not. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy or scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origins in the human will, but prophets through human, though, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's where we get the idea of divine inspiration of scripture. That's the only place that foretelling the future can come from, is from God. Uh, it's unique to the Bible. It's about a third of the Bible. It's like a puzzle. But you got to put the pieces together, like I said. Um, leave your preconceptions behind. Preconceptions. Behind. How many of you uh, read the Left Behind series? Yeah, almost everybody did. It sold up millions of copies. Now, that was a fictional story. You guys all know that, right? All right. Um, so, but it was the basis for a lot of people's prophetic understanding for a long time. Um, and in a lot of ways, it got a lot of things right. I actually got a chance to have dinner one night with Tim LaHaye after he was here at Grace Church, and there was about a dozen of us. And uh, great guy. And his prophecy study Bible is solid as can be. There's a couple areas that I, you know, disagreement, but rock solid. So I'm glad that Tim LaHaye did it and not somebody else, right? Because it was spot on. Um, but you're, we're, what you know, what you understand, just be prepared that if we see it in scripture, that's got to take first place. Amen. All right. There was a article a couple of years ago that came out that said why the rapture doctrine is being left behind. Whatever happened to the once popular theology? Why do so many evangelical Christians reject it today? When I first started teaching script, uh, the end times, the everybody believed the rapture. Everybody believed the pre-trip rapture. Almost everybody, right? Everybody read Left Behind, so it's true, right? And today, I got a stat coming up. About half of the evangelical Protestant church still believes in a pre-trip rapture. But it's only 50%, Right? My job is to get that percentage up because I think it's such an important concept to understand. All right. So now here's Rick Warren. I'm going to be careful here because Rick Warren on the, on. So when I'm on faith radio, I'm on Thursdays, Rick Warren comes on right after me. Right. And I, so I often listen to him on the way home. Now I will tell you this. I was not a fan of the purpose driven life book, but I tell you, because I've been listening to him a lot more. I, don't get me wrong here. I'm going to disagree with Rick Warren on a point, right? But he's solid in so many ways. And his radio program is still on Faith Radio. They just don't put anybody on Faith Radio, right? So um, he's solid in many things. I'm just going to disagree on one point from his book that was written a long time ago. And then we'll talk about this, uh, one of the things that he said about this afterwards. But I want to read this. When the disciples wanted to talk about prophecy... Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. That's from Purpose Driven Life. I would argue, no, the details are our business. The date is none of our business. There's actually tons of information in scripture about his return. And I think it should be part of our business, right? So, and actually a couple of years ago, we were talking about this. You contacted Rick Warren's office and what you got, right? And what you got back was that Rick said through his assistant, no, he believes that it's profitable to study uh, all aspects of prophecy. The end times, I can't remember exactly what was said. So I think that's great. So this is an old quote. I still have it in my presentation. I should probably take it out, but um, let's move on. Oh, here's some of these stats. I'm just going to go through these quick. You can take a look at them. About 36% of senior pastors believe in a pre-trib rapture. Thank goodness ours is one of them. Amen? All right. About 18% believe in a post-trib. 8% believe in mid-trib. 25% don't believe in a literal rapture. That's 25% of senior pastors, Protestant pastors, don't believe in a literal rapture. 
I don't know if you saw Tucker Carlson. He had John Rich on who was arguing that the rapture is a made up doctrine and just a whole bunch of garbage. Oh, I've heard this John Darby stuff. We'll talk about it a bunch of times. But he's listening. To, he's so good on so many things, and he's listening to the wrong voices on, on this one. So 1% believe the rapture already occurred. Go figure that one out now, would you? <laughs> Yet they're still around, and they're still teaching it. So, look, there's been a lot of influences over the last 20, 25 years that have taken our blessed hope away for a lot of people. And I wanna put that blessed hope back. All right? Oh, yeah, I said that already. I want to put the hope back in our blessed hope. Hey, I had a slide on that. All right, so here's the timeline. Remember what I was talking about? I have to balance the joy of discovery with being taught and having it be more understandable about being frustrated longer saying, this is all confusing. I don't know where all the puzzle pieces go. How do I do this? There's so many pieces. This is a 2000 piece puzzle and there's no picture on the box. You know, that can be frustrating, right? So, and balancing that with, okay, if we just do an overview, it's going to help so much, but I don't, I, you can't take my word for it. That's see what I'm struggling with here. We want the Bible as the source, as opposed to the teacher of the source. So Anyway, we're going to do an overview of the end times. So the last time here, we're going to do a 30,000 foot overview of the end times. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Revelation. All right. Those who have taken the, I, the chart's actually in the back of your book. You actually have this. This is by the guy by the name of Clarence Larkin. Clarence Larkin wrote a book called The Greatest Book of Dispensational Truth over 100 years ago. It's an awesome book. Difficult to get through, but it's awesome. He was a draftsman, and he created hundreds of these beautiful drawings. Now, this is a consultant's chart of the end times. I threw in a little artwork here with the scrolls. This is also in your book. Turn to that chart. It's in the middle right in the middle. So this is my chart of the end times. And we'll be using this one. So find that and we'll kind of walk through it. And then each of those little blue diamonds has a description on it. There's more, more scriptures behind each of these and that's on the pages right behind it. Um, by the way, let's go back to Troy. Troy Dobbs put up a chart of the overview. This is Troy's chart that he presented and that I agree with everything on this chart. Uh, I even agree. You are here. How do we know we're here? Right. Well, it also says you are here. So that's how I know. So uh, here's, the, here's the one thing we're going to study. I'm going to take this. This is the MSOL. You guys remember that? Very good. Marriage Supper of the Lamb. We're going we're gonna to take that and we're going to put it down on earth down here instead of up in heaven but other than that absolutely we got the rapture we got the tribulation the second coming the millennial reign satan is loosed for a short while the final judgment the great white throne judgment and then the eternal state absolutely that's exactly what i teach as well why do i have this slide right here oh i i know why this gets to my other point Remember, what we're going to have to do is, this gets to your question, Are, Do we how do we approach the book of Revelation, the end times prophecy, and so on, and really the whole Bible? Are we going to take an allegorical view or a literal view, more properly known as the historical grammatical view? But that's basically saying, what's the plain context that the writer intended for anybody reading it to, to understand it? That's the literal view. Know that when, when you say a literal view, it doesn't mean you take everything literally. You can have figurative language in the literal view. That's all I'm trying to say. The other big question you're going to have to answer as we approach the text is, is all this end time stuff, is it past preterist or is it future? Well, that's a big question. If you make a presupposition that says all this has already happened, well, then you're going to force a preterist view that says, oh, this was all fulfilled in and around 70 AD and so on. And I just wanted to show you really quick, back, back to Troy's sermon. He 
listed these things uh, in four different kind of hermeneutical approaches here. How do we interpret the Bible as the preterist view, the historist view, the futurist view, and the symbolic or spiritual view? We are absolutely going to take a futurist view, and I'm not going to go into this anymore, but this is using just kind of what does the text say and understand it plainly as the author intended it to say. We're not going to spiritualize anything that shouldn't be spiritualized. And you guys get that? All right, because I don't, that's all the time I'm going to spend on that. All right. What's the overview? Am I getting too much feedback? I know it. That's because this mic didn't have, is that better? All right. I pushed it down too far. The, the mic is busted and the system is busted. So I'm just thankful that it's working. What's the first event then on the prophetic calendar? The rapture. You guys at the end of this class will understand what the rapture is, how it differs from the second coming, what happens, who it happens to, what it's really about. The rapture is really about our resurrection. It's about our glorification. It's about receiving our glorified bodies. That is what the rapture is all about. It's resurrection day. And when it happens, not when it happens as in, we can predict when it's going to happen. But when does it happen on our timeline? Does it happen at the beginning, at the middle, or the end? And you are going to be able to understand from Scripture why it has to be at the pre, at, before the tribulation or a pre-tribulational rapture. Do you see what I'm saying? Now, I say that at the start of the class, and my strong desire is for you to not know you know, what I believe on the rapture and where it is, I'd rather have you discover where the rapture is. But then you're going to sit there for weeks and be frustrated. So what I'm going to do is I'll drop clues, right? Oh, yeah. Notice this. This points to a pre-trib rep. This points to a pre-trib. This points to a pre-trib. And you're going to hear me say that over the weeks. There's a reason why we don't cover the rapture until like week eight, less than eight, I think it is. Uh, because once we study all the other details and what's happening, guess what? Where the rapture fits on the timeline, it's just going to fall in place naturally. All right? It will. You'll see it. All right. So the rapture is first. Then we have this thing called the tribulation. It's a seven-year period of time. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And you don't want to be here. There are seven seal judgments, there's seven trumpet judgments, and there's seven bowl judgments that are all talked about in the book of Revelation. This is where we learn uh, about the, the Antichrist comes on the scene and all the things that he does. He does this mark of the beast we were just talking about. Then we have the second coming of Christ. This is where he comes uh, at the end of the tribulation on his white horse, followed by the armies of heaven. And then there's this thousand-year millennial reign. For a thousand years, Jesus will reign on earth. This is actually another big deal. Does There are many Christians today who have, and trust me, they've tried to email me many, many times, arguing that Jesus is never going to rule on earth. And it's like, well, that's funny, because the Bible says that he's going to rule on earth. Actually, a number of times. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Zechariah says his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. He will enter through the eastern gate. I mean, there, there's he will rule from sea to sea. They will go up to Mount Zion and worship him during the millennial reign. There'll be a millennial temple and we'll see all that. Then there is the final judgment, the great white throne judgment. You don't want to be at this judgment. This is the judgment of the lost. This is the judgment of those whose names are not found in the book of life. And they will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And then, and only then, God says, heaven and earth flee from his presence, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And then one of the most important verses in all of the Bible, Revelation 21, verse 3, and God says, 
And then I heard, a. am sorry, and John says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. God hadn't, hasn't dwelt with men since the Garden of Eden. And then they sinned and he had to kick them out. And the rest of the story is all about God working to reconcile mankind back to himself so that one day he can dwell with them again. And that's the eternal state. Couple detail points. When John Rich was interviewing with Tucker Carlson and he said there's no rapture, and it's like, well, then what do you do with 1 Thessalonians 4 16 through 18, Mr. John Rich? It says this For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, who, we who are still alive and on our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Not only is the rapture a source of encouragement, it says that there's a day coming where we will be caught up to heaven. Well, the rapture is not in Scripture. The word rapture is not in Scripture. Well, the word trinity is not in Scripture. Did you know that? You didn't know that? You knew that? Where do we get the word rapture from? Oh, very good. Do you know what you know what the Greek word is for caught up? Oh, yeah, it's not rapture, it's harpazo. But the Latin word, which is when theologians used to study the Bible in Latin, the Latin word for call up for caught up is rapturo. And so we call it the rapture. So you can call it the rapture, you could call it the harpazo, you could call it the great catching up. It doesn't really matter what you call it, but the concept is there. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will certainly come back and take you to be where I am also. Where is Jesus? Heaven. There's a day coming where he is going to take us up to heaven. Now, so much, we'll get to this in the rapture, so I'm getting ahead of myself. There's so many Christians that say, well, I don't, it's not, the word rapture is not in there or something, or is invented by John Darby. We'll talk about John Darby. Well, you know, it's not there. And it's like, what don't you believe? What don't you get when you read something like this? Or what, why are you having trouble? I just, I don't think they can believe that, oh, there's a day coming where we're all going to be caught up into heaven. That sounds too, what, sci-fi or something. And it's like, well, wait a minute here. Is there another instance where someone goes up to heaven? Hmm. Oh, oh yeah. Jesus died. He rose again. He walked on earth for 40 days. And in Acts chapter 1, what happens? He's caught up to heaven. So that the men of, men of Galilee, what are you staring at? What do you mean, what are we staring at? He just went up in the clouds, right? He, he, you know what that event is called? It's called the ascension. But in Revelation, do you know what word is used to describe that event? Harpazo. That's his rapture. Jesus was raptured in Acts chapter 1. And so we too will be raptured. All right. I'm going to have to meet John Rich sometime. Anybody know John Rich? Anybody have his phone number? <laughs> Anybody have Tucker's phone number? No? All right. Seven year tribulation. Like I said, next week you're going to understand the biblical basis for a Seven-year tribulation, that's in Daniel 9, All right? That's where we're going to set, begin our study is in Daniel chapter 9. But Revelation gives us a lot of the details. Daniel 9 gives us the basis for it. Revelation gives us some of the details. You're going to be surprised to learn that we're not going to spend a ton of time in the book of Revelation, which is probably a good thing. You just did a whole year of it with Troy, right? We're going to look at all the other passages that build into this plan that technically aren't in Revelation, but are part of God's plan for the end of the age. End times is all over the place. You're going to see that. I mean, you can go to the Psalms. You can go to 
almost every book of the Bible, and you're going to find information about the end times in it. Cool. This is where the Antichrist, he confirms his covenant, the great harlot, mystery Babylon. We're going to, we'll get to know all the characters. Uh, we have the midpoint where we have this abomination that causes desolation, where this Antichrist sets himself up in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. He's going to be quite a hoot, by the way. And then the second half of the tribulation, this is where the Antichrist Christ makes war on Israel. This is where the mark of the beast is, by the way, in the second half, and so on. So that's the seven-year tribulation. Uh, let's skip over him. Yeah, he's... Everybody knows he's a defeated foe, right? This Antichrist character. Just by, by the way, almost every time the Antichrist is mentioned in Scripture, it reminds us what his fate is. Almost every time. Isn't that cool? This is actually a statue in Brussels. The woman riding the beast. Do they know that they're... I don't know. Here, here's another one that they... This is the EU, EU Parliament building. They modeled it after the Tower of Babel. I mean, why, why would you do that? Do you not know what happened to the at Babel? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't good. Um, the Antichrist Kingdom. Uh, well, let's get. I'm going to skip over this because I'm running out of time. God's wrath. Yeah. But by the way, the Antichrist gets to rule over the earth for that second half of the tribulation period. You know what he gets to rule over? the bold judgments being poured out on the earth. All right, Satan, you want to rule the, the earth? You want to, okay, here you go. You can rule the whole earth. What are you going to rule over? God pouring out his wrath on the earth. There you go. You got it. All right, and then the second coming. Oh, I love this verse too. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Who is that? Church. The church. That's us. You know you get your own white horse? Did you know that? Yeah, do you know what? You guys, you see, you've taken the class before. Yeah. Oh, did I? So you know my horses. I've named my horse already. You know, my, do you remember what my horse's name is? Thunder. Yeah, so you can't have that name. That's my horse's name. So I teach Sunday class. Oh, that's right. We talked about this on Sunday because Brian DeVries, the guy I, I teach in search of, oh, I forgot to mention this. In Search of Truth is the class that I lead Sunday mornings right downstairs in 152. And we, we cover a lot of things, but Brian DeVries kind of co-teaches with me. And uh, he named his horse Lightning <laughs> because lightning always comes before thunder. I know, and he got me, didn't he? He got me, got me good. So, oh, in the Israel thing, okay. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword to with with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his uh, robe and on his thigh, he has this name written: the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Rapture or second coming? Yeah, it's going to get even easier. You'll be able to distinguish every single verse. I love that verse. Then the millennial reign, the kingdom of God. I've got one minute. Oh, and I'm, I always try to end on time, by the way, just to honor your time. Uh, so we'll try to end on time every week. 60 seconds. It's a thousand years. It's on earth. Satan is bound. Christ reigns on earth from Jerusalem. Christians will reign with Christ. The lion will lay down with the lamb, right? Oh, thank you. No. It's the wolf will live with the lamb. Isn't that funny how we, we get phrases in our head? They actually are not in the Bible. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat and the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And the little child will lead them is the actual verse from Isaiah 11. 
but there'll be peace on earth. That's the only time peace has ever come, will ever come to this earth is when the Prince of Peace returns to establish peace on earth. Amen? Then the great white throne judgment will study, I won't go through all those, and the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. I'll just go through those really quick. You can see this is when all things will be named new. God will dwell with man. There is no temple. We'll talk about that. This is the new Jerusalem. This is the eternal state. I love 1 Corinthians 2, 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has in store for those who love him. It's going to be better than what you can even imagine. I can imagine a lot. And it's going to be better than that. Right? Cool. You excited? All right. Lord, we thank you that you have in store for us an inheritance that we can't even fathom. And we look forward to that day. Come, Lord Jesus. When I was lying in bed with a fever, it's like, oh, any any moment, right? Right now you can come, Lord. But now I'm feeling better. And I still say, Lord, come. We're ready. Anytime. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Uh, if you have any questions, email me. I will get the email of this week out in the next couple of days, and this will be up on YouTube. Zoom folks, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's see. Yeah, over 30. I hope it went well. I hope the sound was good and everything technically worked well. And uh, for those that are expecting books in the mail, I'll get those out tomorrow. All right. Thank you.